Hello, today we're going to look at another horrific instance with you. Today's story is a heartbreaking reminder of life's fragility and the fatal consequences of rash decisions. Let this tragedy serve as a call to compassion, guiding our efforts to avoid such pain from befalling future families. Emily Longley was born on February 22, 1994, at a London hospital. She was the first child in Mark and Caroline Longley's young family. Mark's pals teased him about being a father soon. At 26, he felt completely unprepared for parenthood. He was present during the birth, and when the nurse washed the baby and presented her to him, he gently held her in his arms, her small head resting in his palms and her legs barely reaching his elbow. The girl opened her eyes and looked at her father. In that moment, Mark realized parenting would not be a problem for him. A few years later, the Longleys welcomed their second daughter, Hannah. The two blonde girls adored one another and brought delight to their father. He was convinced that keeping the kids warm and safe would show them how much he loved them. The daughters were up surrounded by their parents' unwavering devotion. They had an example of success and happiness right in front of them. Mark Longley worked as a journalist for a local newspaper and Caroline was a teacher. The girls had a bright future ahead of them, just like any parent would want for their child. Emily and Hannah Longley's lives were flipped upside down 10 years later when their parents decided to relocate from Bournemouth to the magnificent landscapes of New Zealand. This was a huge shift for everyone, as moving to another country was a big step. This difficult decision was made for Emily's health when specialists advised her that she required a change of climate. The Longleys traveled halfway around the world, wanting to provide a better life for their girls. And so it was. The climate of New Zealand varies according to its landscape. Most of New Zealand has a temperate marine climate with four distinct seasons. Winters here are generally mild, while summers are relatively cool. The Pacific Ocean and mountain ranges are significant contributors. The English family found the environment and atmosphere ideal. The Longleys and their daughter's life took on a new chapter. Emily attended a prominent private school, and her life carried on until she was metaphorically stabbed in the back by old classmates. Sarah Lee Turblanche, Emily's friend, caused a sensation at school when she revealed that Emily had joined the wrong crowd and was involved with forbidden narcotics. Sarah provided an interview to the school newspaper about a party at Emily's. After surviving initial disappointments and betrayals, Emily returned to England at the end of 2010 to further her study. She went in with her grandparents, Ronald and Zosie Longley, in a spacious detached cottage near the promenade in Southbourne near Bournemouth and enrolled in a British college, hoping for a new start in her life. The decision proved fruitful. Emily, who had struggled in school, adapted to a more relaxed student life and thrived. Emily made progress. Balancing her studies at Brockenhurst College in Hampshire with a job at the Topshop retail store. Emily Longley, 16, was a vivacious, joyful, and extremely ambitious young woman with stunning blonde beauty. Her brilliant attractiveness propelled her to early success in the modeling world, but her engaging charm and compelling charisma set her apart in her community. Emily first met Elliot Vince Turner, then 19, at a party in December 2010. Elliot was the only son of Lee Turner, a wealthy and successful jeweler. He worked at his father's jewelry company in Bournemouth and lived with his family in Queen's Park, an upscale neighborhood. He belonged to the firm, a group of affluent young men who frequented local bars and clubs in Bournemouth and Poole. Elliot Turner, who garnered. The attention of many ladies appeared nearly obsessed with them. Nonetheless, they rapidly became a relationship. Elliot was deeply committed to his girlfriend, who had begun modeling and earning her first salary. She began to catch the attention of other males. Elliot's jealousy of Emily was great. Within four months, their relationship had devolved into a war of incessant disagreements and mutual complaints. Emotional abuse became the norm in this turbulent relationship, which was characterized by Elliot's troubling conduct and relentless envy. If he didn't like her outfit, he would accuse her of looking like a call girl. He hacked her Facebook account to track her actions and communications. 
He also arrived up unexpectedly when she wasn't present. He used his strength and wrath to intimidate Emily. She once wrote him a note stating, stop being so aggressive. However, each event was followed by remorse and apologies, only for the cycle to continue. Elliot finally went from verbal threats to physical measures. He grabbed her throat and assaulted her in public several times. He then rationalized his behavior, blaming Emily for his unpredictable emotional outbursts. Emily became concerned for her life as a result of the constant arguments and fighting. She took a break and went on a vacation with her parents in New Zealand. This was the Longley's nicest Easter holiday ever. Hannah and Emily hung together as if nothing had changed. They walked a lot, laughed a lot, and spent a lot of time together, as if they were expecting to say goodbye soon. Her father held her tightly as they said their goodbyes. She agreed to return in September for the Rugby World Cup. She penned a note to her father while still on the plane. It was very nice to see you. I love you. They have had a strong link between father and daughter when she was born. Emily was last seen alive by her relatives. She returned to the UK with the intention of ending her relationship with Elliot. This occurred, but unfortunately at the expense of a promising young woman's life. Elliot met his girlfriend not with flowers, but with a new round of accusations and disagreements. Elliot came across photos of Emily with two shirtless young men on social media before she returned from New Zealand. Jealous, he invited her to stay the night at his house. Despite their argument, Emily, Sion scented to return to Elliot's family house to talk about their troubles, comforted by the presence of Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita. Her entrance to the residence was met with a bombardment of envy and insults. The young couple frequently yelled and argued. A half hour of ranting was followed by silence. On May 7, 2011, emergency services got a call that 17-year-old Emily Longley had been discovered unconscious in bed. Anita Turner called after discovering the girl in her son's bedroom. Rescuers came on the scene and were only able to confirm her death. Following the girl's death, neighbors noticed Turner sitting in the ambulance with his head in his hands. Elliot Turner was detained immediately following Emily's death, however, he was later released on bail awaiting further inquiry. The investigation began following the unfortunate tragedy. Turner Jr., consumed with guilt, wrote a confession. His parents, determined not to lose their only son, intentionally concealed critical evidence prolonging the investigation. Anita Turner, 51, and Lee Turner, 53, stole a coat their son wore on the night of the incident from their home, recovered the confession letter from its pocket, and soaked it with bleach to destroy crucial evidence. During the investigation, it was decided to discreetly install listening devices around the expansive Turner family home. From May 18th to June 14th, police conducted a series of recordings inside the Turner home. After receiving evidence of a family discussion about creating evidence and concerns about lying to the authorities, the police seized the household computers in search of additional evidence, which they discovered. A look at the browser's search history indicated searches for death by strangling and how to escape a murder accusation. In July, all three family members were arrested and charged with being involved in the crime and purposefully concealing evidence. Elliot Turner denied any involvement, blaming Emily for his woes. A forensic reconstruction of the incident revealed that Elliot and Emily engaged in a struggle on that fatal day. Elliot used force to restrain her, putting her face down on the bed with a pillow. He then threw away the pillow and started to strangle her with his fists. When she grew silent, he stood up and exited the room. Pathologists examined Emily's body and discovered injuries compatible with strangulation. Elliot had scratches on his arm, and Emily's fingertips contained his DNA, indicating a struggle between them. The trial found that Elliot's behavior towards Emily was marked by threats, hostility, violence, control, and possessiveness. These concerning characteristics worsened and on a fateful night in May 2011, a furious dispute broke out between the pair about Emily's choice of attire and her images with unknown males. The affluent family could not afford to lose their son and damage their reputation. Elliot's hired lawyers vigorously defended him. 
the defense tried to downplay the tormentor's role in the young woman's death, claiming she may have used narcotics. However, Dorset police commissioned an independent toxicological investigation, which revealed no narcotics or other prohibited compounds in the victim's bloodstream. The wealthy jeweler and his wife disposed of evidence to conceal how their jealous son murdered aspiring New Zealand beauty Emily Longley. Elliot Turner, 20, was found guilty by a jury at Winchester Crown Court in May of killing 17-year-old Emily in his bed during a jealous outburst. Judge Dobbs stated at his sentencing that he bullied, pursued, threatened, and abused Emily in order to maintain control over her as his trophy girlfriend. The court also warned Elliot to forget about Champagne, Bentleys, and females as he sentenced him to life in prison, noting that he must serve at least 16 years before being eligible for parole. His parents, Lee, 54, and Anita, 51, were jailed in the same court after being found guilty of obstructing justice by concealing evidence. They covered the crime by shredding their son's confession letter and deleting critical evidence from their Bournemouth home. Their son was sentenced to nine months in prison for obstructing justice by concealing evidence. The prosecution claimed Turner suffocated Emily with a pillow before strangling her when she returned to his home to address their predicament following a heated quarrel that night. Emily's father, Mark Longley, called Elliot Turner vile and voiced his wish that Turner would suffer every day in prison. Elliot Turner was convicted guilty of ending her life in May 2012 and sentenced to life in prison. His parents, Anita Turner and Lee Turner, were both imprisoned. They were sentenced to 27 months in prison for deceiving. The authorities about the incident and deleting their son's confession note. Because it was a homicide investigation, the police kept her body, and it wasn't until September that she could be sent home in a closed casket. The Turners were released in 2013. Turner's reduced sentence appeal was dismissed the same year. However, British justices ruled otherwise after hearings at the High Court of London. Lord Chief Justice Royce Justice Globe observed in his verdict that it is apparent that he harbored ideas of ending her life for long time due to wounded pride, which culminated in her death. Simon Jones, one of the victorious prosecutors, indicated during the sentencing that Emily's death was the result of domestic abuse. When Elliot heard his punishment, he stated, I never wanted. To hurt her, I was simply defending myself. Elliot Turner, Emily Longley's offender, is currently serving a life sentence in a Kent jail for the savage murder of the young aspiring model. The court determined that he would not be eligible for parole for at least 16 years. Turner, according to the Daily Star, has covered the walls of his prison cell with images of Emily, showing a disturbing and even obsessive relationship with his victim. Surprisingly, even behind bars, Turner apparently expressed his wish to return to a life of champagne, Bentleys, and birds. Such an attitude raises concerns about his lack of remorse and the possibility of continuing destructive behavior after release. Furthermore, Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita Turner, were imprisoned for perverting justice by burning their son's confession letter and interfering with evidence at the crime site. This emphasizes the gravity of the situation and the combined influence of the Turner family's activities on the quest of justice for Emily Longley. Following the conclusion of the trial, Emily's father began to investigate domestic abuse. He portrayed Elliot as an abuser using patterns and behaviors. He was continuously thinking about ending her life. It was simply a matter of time. To love someone is not attempting to dominate their lives, calling them nasty names or isolating them from their friends. That is not love. A woman is considered like a trophy. Such relationships focus primarily on the man. Emily's father was unkind to her before she went to New Zealand, according to her memories, but she refused to tell us. I'm not sure why, but if she had, things might have turned out differently. Now I don't think of Turner or his family. He is in prison, and I hope he suffers every day. If I think too much about what he did, my fury increases, and it is the type of anger that can overwhelm you. He never considered the people who had loved, nurtured, and reared Emily over the course of 17 years. He stood behind her, placed his arms around her neck, and took her life. 
Even today, years later, it's difficult to imagine somebody could do this to Emily. Emily's parents split after the tragedy, yet they still find it difficult to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays. Easter is particularly traumatic because it was the family's last holiday together. On May 6, 2011, Emily was still alive. She was speaking on Facebook with her father just a few hours before the incident occurred. She appeared normal and joyful, with no trace of apprehension. On May 7th, everything changed. Emily's father awoke after receiving a phone call. He did not respond right away. By the time he woke up, he had numerous missed calls from his ex-wife, Caroline, as well as multiple texts on his cell phone. Texts from her were not uncommon, but the volume of calls and messages was concerning. Finally, he picked up an incoming call. His younger daughter, Hannah, was crying uncontrollably on the other end. He could hear his ex-wife shouting, Emily is gone, Emily is gone. He broke down while sitting on the same couch Emily had been on just a week before. What was she going to do after college? This could not be true. How could such a vibrant young girl be gone? He couldn't recall anything else about that night. Emily's father did not sleep till he boarded the plane for England. According to Emily's father's account, I remember being driven to Auckland, stopping in a little town to gas, and seeing Emily's portrait on the main page of the Herald. When I noticed the headline in the station, I felt I was going to be sick. At the airport, people were throwing their copies away, and I wanted to tell them who she was and why they should preserve that newspaper. It felt like an age until Mark Longley arrived in England. He was still in disbelief, unable to realize that his voyage to his once-loving England was to identify his beloved daughter, Emily. He still hoped there had been an error. They carried him straight to the mortuary, where Emily's body lay. He stood in a room with Caroline, a police officer, and the undertaker, who pointed to a window and stated that the body was in the next room. The undertaker pointed to the window the light turned on, and they may enter the apartment when they were ready. The light turned on. Mark and Caroline, their hands frozen with terror, stood unable to enter the threshold of that room. They were ready to scream that it wasn't their daughter, but rather Emily. She was laying on the stretcher, covered in a purple sheet, and appeared to be sleeping. Her father approached and caressed her face. Emily's father remembered her skin as smooth but extremely cold, with a beautiful alabaster tint. I wanted to run away and pretend I hadn't seen anything, but I stood there holding her hand, staring at the face I had studied so closely when she was born except now her eyes were closed, and I realized this was no joke. She wasn't about to sit up and shout boo. My daughter Emily was gone. In the midst of such horror, all tomorrows become yesterday. When a deluge of emotions pours down, bombarding and overwhelming the soul, you realize your complete helplessness. That day at the mortuary was the last time her parents saw Emily. The grief of losing someone does not become any easier. Time does not heal, rather. It teaches you how to live with it. Everyone constantly commented on Emily's beauty, and it continues to be discussed. She had a great, warm, and kind side to her personality. She would approach you, rap. Her lengthy arms around you and give you a firm hug. Most importantly, Emily's family misses the woman she could have been. They will never know how her life might have turned out if she had been allowed to live it. Years later, Emily's father remarried. He has a fantastic wife, Hillary, and a beautiful son, Hunter, who is growing up in their household. Emily's younger sister, Hannah, has graduated from university and established her own life in which spousal abuse has no role. Their greatest regret is that Emily is not present to share the happy moments with them. Thanks for watching, gentlemen. Subscribe to the channel, there are many stunning stories ahead.